So in his biography, you just read about the man who was born the son of a professor of theology and who goes through the normative uh, training that such men would be exposed in his generation and then he becomes a pastor but it's in becoming a pastor in a village church in Switzerland that he began to recognize the enormous problem of communicating the truths of God in the word to preach uh, is another kind of phenomenon and how to break into the consciousness of bourgeois Swiss people if you have not encountered the Swiss mentality, you ain't lived yet. Really a remarkable little nation, but such a powerful civilization. And of course, probably the highest standard of living in the world. And the kind of um, hubris, H-U-B-R-I-S, pride, that comes from people who have an exalted economy, way of life, culture, civilization, who have avoided the consequences of two world wars. They have never experienced a bombing. But what they are experiencing now is drug plague in the city of Zurich and even giving out free needles and uh, AIDS tests and their whole generation in their jackets, their leather jackets and their high standard living just going to Cirque. But this is a man of an earlier time and the turning point for him was the necessity to preach and to find a compelling way to put, bring to a hearing people of that kind, the truths of God, he wrestled with this agonizing thing of the strange phenomenon of preaching. And the greater turning point was World War I. And if you ever go back to that period of time, August 1914, and see how serene Europe was, how the age began in the, ni- in the early 20th century with expectancy, hope, Confidence, the age of progress, the end of disease, uh, reconciliation, human brotherhood, science, technology, the industrial age, commerce. There was, it was such a, a euphoria of uh, optimism. And then like men playing with their tin soldiers, the Kaiser, Wilhelm, and uh, the British war office, and the fleet, and the navy, and imperialisms, and um, the Balkan thing which is today again erupting and boom an event broke out I think men wanted opportunity to go from their playing with tin soldiers on their drawing boards out into the field of action they had romantic and idealistic notions it was an unreality that finally took its toll and we're still paying for it World War II is nothing more than the continuation of the unresolved issues of World War I and uh, the Holocaust has come out of that, and out of uh, genocide, mass murder, mayhem and destruction, and we're, st- and we're still reaping that. So when some of his former professors and men of repute in theology began to endorse Kaiser Wilhelm and the national aspirations of imperial Germany, he began to have second thoughts, like how could they be giants of the faith and at the same time dupes and uh, um, supporters of nationalist rivalries and national ambitions? Something is wrong here. And it required, and and the consequences were death on on a massive scale. And so it required him to go back to the drawing board and to go through the faith again and to search it out and wrestle his way through it. And so we are the beneficiaries of a man who um, was led by God in that way. Uh, Also a remarkable personality and a lover of Mozart and a man who smoked a pipe. And uh, they they say quite a a personality, always joyous. And uh, so I just commend them to you. To sum up, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the great verdict of God, the fulfillment and proclamation of God's decision concerning the event of the cross. If you can write one statement like that, you can hang up your hat and retire for the rest of your life and retire with a good conscience. Someone asked a man who gave a public address, how long did it take you to write that? And he said, a lifetime. You cannot read Karl Barth except 
in this way. And we're spoiled by cheaper reading. This is not gone with the wind. You don't just... (laughs) Word for word for word. If, uh, If any who have heard me say this before, it's worth repeating. In Germany, I have contact with just a precious little band of souls. Not the Gobson, they, they are precious, but in Frankfurt, the Baumann family, uh, uh, the woman uh, is a, an outstanding saint. And they have a little circle of friends who share the same quality of faith. And when I was with them the last time, I was so impressed, just an overnight stay. You know, with fellowship, to have fellowship with saints like that for an evening is golden. And the memory of it lingers and something has come as a deposit that remains. And at one point I, I was just so impressed with them and they were not trying to be impressive. That they were just themselves. I said, how is it? There's something about you guys. You have something in common. There's a quality of spirituality of life that I find enormously impressive. Can you explain it? Oh, Art, we were all inducted into the faith and brought up in the faith by the same teacher. I said, who is that? I was thinking some grand master of the faith, some great heavy uh, theologian, a simple woman. I think she came out of some kind of village background in Germany who plowed in and wrestled with the faith herself like um, Bart and anyone else who has ever come to a real apprehension. And she had one basic principle and it, and it transformed our lives. I said, what was that? She said, when she taught us the word, she taught us to ponder every single word, word for word, word for word. And I so appreciate that. I would even go so far, syllable for syllable, especially the word of God, just to weigh it, ponder it, hold it, reflect it, like a cow, bring it up in your cud and chew on it. We are the victims of such a casual and cheap superficial civilization that breezes through everything. That's why we can put on and take off wives like like nobody's business. Divorce, the name of the game. Friendships, fellowships, we breeze through everything at the level of surface. And a lot of what we were talking last night is the very consequence. So... Listen to, to a man who has given his life to wrestling through to an understanding of the great epical event of God in the earth. The death, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. God as man, suffering a necessary death and being raised up out of it to ascend on high to the right hand of God and of power. There's no way that you can ever exhaust the meaning of that one epical event. It's in two parts, death and resurrection. And the fact that the world has dismissed it, even the church, by glibly passing over it, has brought a judgment upon us that is called Easter. So that every year we should grovel in our humiliation to see people with their chocolate bunnies and Easter eggs and their Easter outfits, and that the great song of Easter is written by a Jew, Irving Berlin. How does that go? So it celebrates clothing, parades, an event, you wear your best clothing. It's remarkable. There's an innate talent in the world so calculated against God that it takes the holiest and most awesome epical events given to transform and to transfigure humanity and save it out of its death and domesticate it and make of it a culture and a plaything. That is a condemnation and a judgment against a church that has not understood its own heritage nor proclaimed it and stood for it and made it known not only in its speech but in its very being. And in that vacuum, you can expect that the world is going to make music. So listen to what this man says. To sum up, this is a concluding statement. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the great verdict of God. 
You know what a verdict is? It's what we're waiting for in the O.J. Simpson case. This is God's verdict, a final statement, his own appraisal, approval, and an evaluation of what? What is the resurrection the verdict of? This is God's verdict on Jesus' death. And if it had not come, think of the ambivalence, the ambiguity, the question mark that would have hovered 2,000 years later over that sacrifice. Was it really valid? Did it need to be made? Was Jesus a misguided martyr who brought himself to a place of needless suffering and death that could rightly have been avoided and served no real significant purpose? And it's maudlin and sentimental to celebrate that death because it served no real purpose. <clears throat> he would have been better off alive where we would have had more years of his teachings and of his parables and of his example than he should have been cut off in the prime of his life. For what? There's nothing more foolish. You guys don't understand the scandal of the gospel. That this man who hung on the cross naked before the eyes of his kinsmen, orthodox, where to hang on a tree is the ultimate statement of shame, and to be executed by the goyim for a Gentile to touch a Jew. Remember how Peter could not even come into the house of the Gentiles or eat with them. To be murdered by Gentiles is utter disgrace, let alone to suffer the death of a, of a criminal and between criminals. And you're going to tell me that that's God? And that's the God of Israel? That that's the God of the burning bush? Because Jesus said to him, when they said, who do you think yourself to be? Are you greater than our father Abraham? He said, I tell you, verily, verily, I say unto you, that before he was, I am. Mm. He saw my day and was glad. Oh, now we know you have a demon. You're not even yet 50 years old. And you say that he saw your day? Verily, verily, I say unto you, <coughs> before Abraham was, I am. And the next verse says, and they took up stones to kill him. Who would dare take the holy name of God on his mouth, who is just an itinerant preaching bum, who had not a place to lay his head, and say that I am the same one as spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, when Moses said, and who shall I tell the people is sending me? After all, I've been in exile for 40 years. I'm not number one in popularity. Tell them that the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob is sending them, the God of Israel, and moreover, this shall be my name throughout all your generations as a memorial unto you. I am that I am. And here's this preaching nothing. This drifter had no real place saying before Abraham was, I am. And the same one now hanging on the cross in the most despicable form of death where you have to avert your eyes to look upon that terrible cadaver. There was not just an execution, but the most malevolent, vicious expression of the hatred of the powers of darkness against the Son of God. When it says that he was marred more than any man, and that he has no beauty that we should desire him. It was not speaking of what he was before his crucifixion, but in his crucifixion. He was a battered lump. He was a gangrenous cadaver. He was contorted. He was, his bones were virtually pulled out of joint. His jaw was a gape. You ever see someone fall asleep and a little saliva falls out of their mouth and, they, and the, their mouth is open? It's so unbecoming to that person's dignity. How did you like to be found like that in your death? That's how they saw him. And that's why the disciples on the road to Emmaus were so disconsolate and crestfallen. Why are you looking this way? Jesus said to these two men. Oh, don't you know why you were strange in these parts? He, a prophet great in word and deed, whom we thought to be the Redeemer of Israel, has just been cru uh, uh, cruelly murdered. 
So we just need to let that scandal seep in. It's the most calculated offense to human sensibility and especially to religious sensibility. That's what you need to understand. God was making a statement once and for all, it's not again to be repeated, in which he is confounding, confusing, and contradicting all that men have and would celebrate as truth, righteousness, order, religion, morality, ethics, the good life, good sense, rationality, in which they could show themselves superior. Jesus Christ on the cross is God's statement of condemnation of all that phony baloney, which if it had not come, men would have had no alternative to this day but to live in deception and think it to be truth. The crucifixion of Jesus is God's repudiation of man in all of his forms and in his best forms, Jewish religion and Roman law. The two greatest expressions of its generation and whatever would be its corollary today were judged at the cross because the best of what they were crucified Christ. Not the worst, the best. The high priest said it's necessary for the nation that one man die. And the powers that be resented the threat that Jesus was thought to be for their own status quo and their political uh, um, security, that he would be recognized as some other king. And the mocking thing over the cross in three languages, oh, you think I'm doing this justice? This, uh, we're just feeling this. This is We're at the faintest intimation of the enormity of this event. In three languages, Jesus Christ, king of the Jews. What a mock to the man who came and will again come as king of the Jews. And if he doesn't come king of the Jews, he doesn't come king of anything. Mm. And he's going to become and be that king in the very place where he was executed, jeered, and mocked. That's going to be his citadel, his sanctuary, and the place of his rule out of that Zion. I mean, can you, can you catch something of the dimensions mm. of this drama? that only God could have conceived and willing to wait 2,000 years for his comeuppance for his, what's the word, satisfaction suffering 2,000 years of having his son blasphemed not only in the world but by the church and made into religious forms and Easter eggs and suffer that for 2,000 years until the day will come when every knee shall bend and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that the law of the Lord shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. And he shall make Jerusalem his sanctuary and his dwelling. What a, what a consummation for God's long patience. Now here's the catch, saints. It'll never happen. You ready for this? Got your seatbelt on? Except for us. Dun, 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 dun. This is not automatic. It's not in the bag. It requires a church. A church was born out of Jesus' rent side. And its enablement came when he brought his own blood before the throne of God in heaven and sprinkled it on that mercy seat of which the one on the earth was only a physical uh, corollary. The great one and the important one was the one in heaven. And Jesus brought his own blood into that place once and for all. And because of that, something was sent down, the Spirit of the Lord, upon the church waiting in obedience to the Lord, for whom, but to whom all authority had been given in his exaltation from death, and were filled with that Spirit, and on the basis of that enablement, set in motion the phenomenon called the church, whose greatest glory yet waits to be seen. Now, if you understand that, you'll understand why we can't so glibly, quickly, and easily say yea and amen and hallelujah to anything that comes down the pike. In fact, from my perspective, 
31 years in the faith, all that has come down the pike does not seem consonant with the call and the glory that God intends for the church, but something less and other than that. A cheap alternative and a playing with the holy things that God intends for the phenomenon of the church birthed out of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Holy, 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 you shall be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will be a father unto you. <clears throat> the principal purpose of the church in the last days is Israel's restoration from death. That the phenomenon of death and resurrection by which the age began will it conclude it. That Israel right now, while we're sitting here, is in process of death. Politically, socially, culturally, militarily. And we're going to see it in a shocking way. And when we see it, it will come suddenly. And it will unnerve and uh, disorient, if not um, um, destroy the shallow faith of many, who have no anticipation of Israel's necessary future death. Israel cannot serve the purposes of God as being the wellspring and the, the locus of his theocratic rule, except in a state of resurrection. That means, according to what we understand by the paradigm of Jesus' death and resurrection, there's got to be a death, not a progressive amelioration or improvement of their condition <coughs> so you already have two different wisdoms at play numbers of them who will be strewn into the world as captives and as the victims of the last days affliction that will come to Israel will be brought back in the millennium in the millennium by kings and by rulers and by those who formerly abused and um, victimized uh, the helpless um, Israelis who were devastated by these armies and nations, who bring them back on mules and litters and on their shoulders because they will have been converted by the enormous demonstration of God's mercy to that people and will honor the God who not only judged them but restored them. We're going to see a reenactment of the whole drama of the death of the Son of God and his resurrection in that people who from the first in the Exodus 4 are called the Son of God. There's an enormous parallel, and it needs be done. But Israel will not be raised from the dead except through the church who can bring to Israel the testimony and the witness and the power of resurrection itself to raise it from the dead in the same way that Jesus did at the tomb of Lazarus. If Jesus was anything other than a son of God, if he were only a religious practitioner or a, revi a revivalist, uh, I'm asking your gracious condescension, Bill, as I'm taking these little jibes, <clears throat> Lazarus would have remained in his grave. Well-meaning intentions would not have been enough. Only a son of God in the authority of the Father. That's what makes a son a son. Because the Father can give to a son his authority without fear of misappropriation of his glory. Think of what that means. How many of us could handle it? That's why we have such shallow teaching and shallow preaching because God is not giving his authority and depth to men who would use it and usurp it for their own ends and for their own names their own movements and religious successes that's why they're condemned to the shallowness that pervades them because they're not sons they may employ the language of sonship but it does not constitute its reality because what is missing is death. Well, <clears throat> there have been deaths 
but not the ultimate and final national death that is yet future. And the uh, evidence of it, the truth of it is, that we don't see the resurrected nation in the character of God that comes with resurrection, which is to say, newness of life. It's a good question to put to us. What are we exhibiting of the resurrection? Uh, Unless we are exhibiting the newness of life, we have only subscribed to a correct principle but have not entered into the awesome reality. Do you know why? Because there's an instinctive aversion to death. We don't want to taste it. We don't want to suffer it. And therefore, we're content merely at the doctrinal and creedal level to subscribe to the truth of something, but are not able to demonstrate that truth. And my point is this. Unless there's a church of the last days that are the sons of God, that are moving in the awesome reality, power, and authority of resurrection, Israel remains in her grave. If the previous deaths of Israel had accomplished this, there would be no need for a future death, a time of Jacob's trouble, another dispersal into the nations, another massive affliction, another humiliation. But I believe that the scriptures show that it's yet future, because one of the principal things accomplished by it is this, then you will know that I am the Lord who had both spoken and performed this. If Israel had come to that knowledge, it would not be in its present condition. Um, Virtually all the prophets show a last day's devastation and a last day's return, and that the last thing on the return where the hills drip with new wine and that the, hog, that the plowers are already on the heels of those who are reaping. There's, there's such a millennial blessedness that before they can take in the crop, already the, they're plowing, you know, it, it, they're just overflowing with honey that, uh, that uh, falls upon them and, and new wine, is that they will no longer again be discomfited or fear or be driven from their boundaries, and they will be able now to rest in peace. And uh, you will plant your vineyards and you will drink from it. And not others who will have stripped you. Indicates right up to the time of the millennial blessedness, the last historic experience of Israel is suffering and death and humiliation, which is exactly what Jesus suffered. And it may well be that we Jews who failed, and that's how our whole discussion began, to recognize the significance of the advent of Jesus and his death and suffering, will, when we go through it ourselves, all of a sudden say, hey, this is what he suffered, and see in our suffering the truth and the significance of his. And uh, and that may well be part of the wisdom of God and the necessary wisdom. The best way to view that in terms of the end is now not the Roman centurion standing at the foot of the cross and watching this agonized victim suffer a death in a unique way, but Israel itself, world Jewry, standing at the foot of the cross of the church and watching the church suffering in an extraordinary way for its own sake and saying, this thing that we have ridiculed and blasphemed, that we flipped the the TV switch and we've seen the televangelists and all of their scandals and understood the the, the corruption of these guys long before the church itself recognized it, who were still paying the bill gladly, we now see in this the Son of God. Now, to see the Son of God is to see God, because what is a Son of God but the exemplary uh, demonstration that in his face we beheld the glory of the Father. The Son shows the Father. That's why Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. And when the Son of God, which is the church of the last days, the remnant people of God, who do not have an exclusivistic um, uh, pride, we are it, because it's incompatible with being a son. To show the image of God as a son is to show the humility of God when that will be exhibited, as dumb as Jews are, comparable to the dumb-dumb that the Roman centurion was. See, that's the beauty of it. 
however perverse in their minds, however obdurate, unseeing, however every, every other witness has failed to communicate the truth of the gospel, this demonstration in suffering and death is ultimate. And it may well be that that is our destiny. We're on a collision course ourselves. The crucifixion, the suffering and death of the church of the last days. And, it's, and there are many references I won't say many, several significant ones that should not be overlooked. Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 and 11, I think, speak of the affliction that must come when God gives to the beast the power to overcome the saints. It's totally inexplicable and totally contrary to the theme promulgated by the revivalist movements Mm -hmm. that uh, the defeat of the powers comes now through our worship. So let's rev it up and turn up the amplifiers and and, uh, use our worship militantly to overcome the powers. You know what the powers are saying? What else is new? Mm -hmm. They're not impressed by decibels of sound and shouts that come from vacuous and carnal Christians who are not reconciled to the cross in their own lives, their own marriages, and their own fellowships. It's It's a vain, carnal demonstration of mere noise that a sound and fury signifying nothing. The final defeat of the powers comes in the same way as the initial defeat came when Jesus made of them an open spoil at the cross. And that's why it says in 1 Corinthians that if the rulers of this world knew, they would never have crucified the Son of Glory. And those dum dum still have not learned the lesson because they're going to crucify us. And in the crucifixion of us comes their final defeat. If we bear our suffering and our death with the same magnanimity and graciousness and lack of complaint and ability to forgive that was exhibited by Jesus, which is to say, exhibiting God as God. But if we so much as whimper, if we so much as lose it, if we so much as get hit by the blind side and something rises up in that involuntary way of getting angry and retaliating or railing against those who are drubbing us, we have failed. Can you see why what the church is and why God is dealing with us as he is dealing with us and why we're going through all of these agonies now? It's to bear then what we must and bear it as one corporate life together as the body of Christ and to bear it with equanimity, magnanimity, grace, humility, patient suffering, forbearance, uncomplainedness, and forgiveness. Who right now would have a tough time even approaching that with other Christians, let alone against the hostile world. And what if the ones who are persecuting us are Jews themselves? For whom we are suffering these things? Which is exactly how Jesus died. And jeering us at the same time? With what grace will we bear that? You know that uh, you can hear something from a stranger who can call you names. But when you hear it from your own wife, it's devastating. You understand what I'm saying? When someone who is close to you says something that, is, that would, be, would leave you unaffected if it was said by a stranger, you come apart at the seams. Because of the, the proximity, the depth of that, the intimacy of that relationship. So when those charges will come to us from Jews themselves, they'll call us every name in the book. We're traitors, we're this, we're that, we're, we're trying to rob them of their Judaism uh, Hitler, we're worse than Hitler. Hitler only sought to destroy their bodies. We're out to destroy their souls. And we'll answer them, not a word. No self defense. No self justification. Willing to suffer, being misunderstood. Reviled against. But we don't answer back in kind. And when they see that, which they saw in Stephen, you know the way Stephen died, the, the archetypal martyr, the magnanimity while the stones are crashing into his skull breaking his his nose bone and and into the sockets of his eyes and his own blood is running into his mouth 
he is completely impervious to his own suffering. And saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their child. Having said that, he fell asleep. But his statement was not a retaliation to being provoked. His statement was an obedience to the Father, which, which provoked his death. If he had played his cards right, if he had been diplomatic, if he had said, uh, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, uh, please, you guys have it all wrong. I'm not in any way talking against the temple. I want you to understand that. It's just that in a symbolic way, the temple... The, he didn't say anything like that. He opened his mouth like, like Jesus on the Mount of Beatitudes, and he taught them. In other words, he was already exemplifying the resurrection life in the form that the Lord of life was pleased to express through his mouth. That means that we have to be available to speak sermonic things like the, like Beatitudes that will bless or harsh, judgmental and confrontational things that might provoke our very death. And we'll speak to one or the other with the same equanimity for it doesn't matter whether we receive the applause of men or their stonings. Can you get that? This Stephen was a son of God and a son of the resurrection. His words were not calculated by him. He had no thought of what the consequence would be for himself. Just the life of God surged through him. And when he came to that final gush, as your fathers did, so do you also. You do always grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It was not very diplomatic. No more than Paul at Athens saying, uh, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. You, what do you tell you? Hey, haven't you ever been to a school of discipleship and evangelism? You don't insult your hearers, especially if they're intellectuals and philosophers. The last thing they think themselves to be is superstitious. You don't begin by telling them that. <laughs> you lose your hearers. <laughs> See, every principle of reason and of man and of religion is almost always contradicted by God when he will have the total possession of vessels through whom they can be contradicted, who have no regard for themselves. When Paul spoke that, he didn't have any assurance that he would be able to come down from that mount that he had ascended. And in my article on revival, I said something like, this first adumbration of uh, reaction against those who don't go along as being resistant to God and opposing the revival and uh, having a religious spirit and even more hostile uh, recriminations may be the first adumbration, the first resonance of what will finally be perfected when they will kill us and claim they are doing God a service in their synagogues, in their religious institutions, in, in their perfect confidence that they are doing God's service and that we somehow are the ungainly ones who are impeding the ecumenical progress of mankind, where they're finally coming to a place now of agreement, as in fact many of the same key revival figures are involved in the ecumenical and Catholic thing that is moving toward the one world uh, church and economic system that the scriptures tell us to expect. Yep. So we're not playing games here, guys. Uh, well, you went to here, you know, abandon hope or gird your loins at least. You're being, you're being fitted for last day's confrontation. We will be brought into their synagogues, but I doubt very much it will have a Star of David on it. More likely it will have the cross as a piece of architectural decoration mm -hmm. with men perfectly confident that they are really where the action is and you ungainly characters with your religious spirits and pharisaical pride don't see and are in the way and the obstruction uh, when we're at the very threshold, not just of a breakthrough of revival, but an ecumenical world order that will guarantee peace. And at, at last, listen, even the Jews are willing to come see this and be part. You just hold that and see to what degree what I'm intimating will become increasingly clear as we go on. Keep your, eye, uh, your finger on the pulse. What's happening already ecumenically by men like uh, uh, Bill Bright of uh, Campus Crusade, Charles Colson, uh, uh, Jay Packer, 
um, the head of Fuller Theological Seminary, some of the most estimable names in evangelical Christianity, have already signed the pact with their Catholic equivalents by which they agree not to proselytize from each other and to recognize the, the uh, validity of each other's faith confession and that to agree together in the things that we have in common, addressing the moral concerns of our generation about abortion and, de- and the cultural decline. I'll tell you that the same heart that cannot say yea and amen to the revival thing is beating like a trip hammer with alarm and resonate, re- resonating every kind of concern over these first steps toward ecumenical world order. Isn't that strange that I should be so impervious and dead to the one thing and so keenly alive to the other? And I'll say that that's not an accident. That is, that is a very statement of somehow, I don't know how to say it, the reality and the truth of God in us, in how we respond to modern phenomena of the one kind or the other, that it's almost ironic, our inability to respond to the one, so celebrated as revival, makes us equally, by the same condition, so alive to sense the devious, subterranean, deceptive things already at work, bringing us to a last day's configuration of the kind that the scriptures have told us to expect. I just listened to the (laughs) debate between uh, Michael Brown and uh, Rabbi Shaket, and Michael Brown raises the question in the debate. Listen. How can you commend Christianity to Gentiles if you tell us as Jews that Jesus is not the Messiah of Israel and that we're making a grievous error to celebrate him as that? How can you then commend the same uh, uh, misbegotten uh, presumer uh, to Gentiles? And his answer was, it's okay for them. That's what you like and you you can believe it and it makes you a better people? Fine. Mm -hmm. But for Jews, it's foreboding. I mean, this... I had to say to my mother once on the phone when she said, it's okay for the goyim. Jesus is okay for the goyim, the Gentiles. I said, listen, mom, he's either the Messiah of all mankind or he's the Messiah of none. Listen, guys, we're coming full circle. Mm -hmm. And the same vehement, bitter opposition to the truth of God in the faith and the gospel of Jesus Christ by which the generation began is going to conclude it. And that's why God is not babying you. You would have liked to have been babied and made Mm -hmm. nice, but he he entered you into a much more severe, I won't say ruthless, if I had been in charge, it would have been. (laughs) 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 Because, And I, I even prayed this morning, Lord, only you know the end from the beginning. Only you know the things that are future for us that we only faintly anticipate and what kind of preparation we need to have now. And I'm asking you to employ this last session to uh, put something in us and these young people who are leaving that will serve them in good stead until that day and through that day. And here I am on on one line of of Karl Barton. We haven't even begun to examine it yet. (laughs) See? Okay. But I think all of this is very good, very rich, very necessary. And noticing, by the way, how much... It relates to last night. As if God himself had set the agenda, Mm -hmm. brought Bill, brought his theme, brought the examination, and now we find ourselves almost involuntarily having to make reference to it in order to speak about end-time realities and the remarkable differences that will exist and the oppositions and tensions between a remnant people and those who will think that they're doing God's service. What is the factor that distinguishes the one from the other? All are sincere. What saves us from subscribing to error that seems to be conferring so much good and blessing? What what will keep a remnant people in the narrow path and make them candidates for suffering and death? What, what is the one factor that is crucial in such an age of confusion and all kinds of things are 
that, that are overwhelming in their character and seem full of blessedness and people giving testimonies of what they received. And how do you wend your way through that and stay in the right place in God? The issue of the cross itself. If that cross is not daily operative, if we're not willing to suffer its deaths, as something of our flesh rises up, if we find a way to skirt around it, uh, we make ourselves to that degree candidate for deception. The issue of being saved from deception is the issue of the cross. And our willingness to be ruthless with regard to ourselves, to bear the suffering of it when God makes the issue clear. If we run from something, if we're escapist, If we rationalize and justify our conduct and find a way to explain it that gratifies us and saves us from the awareness of sin as sin, then we are to that degree candidates for deception. The love of the truth is the only thing that saves us from deception. And truth is everything as God sees it and the most sterling, acute expression of that truth is Christ and Him crucified. And so as the church has moved away from the cross, and has allowed the cross only to be a ceremonial and architectural decoration, but it is not living a cruciform life, is not willing for the suffering of the cross, but wants the blessing, which I would say is a definition of the charismatic movement, then you become candidate for deception. And deception will come, and likely come from very God himself, who will give lying uh, delusions to those who have rejected the love of the truth. Why does it take a love? Mere tolerance for the truth, or even respect for the truth, is not enough. Only a love for the truth keeps from deception. Because truth is painful. Especially the truth about ourselves. I couldn't help it. The devil made me. It's my upbringing. I had suffered this, my that, like that. We we have all kinds of ways to rationalize this. We don't want to see the truth about ourselves. And um, we've got to be ruthless in this regard. And apply the cross and bring to the death that thing that God brings to the surface (coughs) and allows us to see. How do you maintain... How do you obtain and maintain a condition of humility, which is the sine qua non, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, the Latin formula of what is absolutely and essentially necessary for the overcoming and authentic spiritual life is a humility. The remnant people of God. Particularly if you have that consciousness about yourself. Yes, I'm in that remnant. I want to be. But the very awareness that you are a remnant is the same very thing that can cultivate a place of pride and exclusivity. It's a contradiction. It's like Jesus knowing that he was the Son of God and that he was sent of the Father, and yet he walked through his life in such a selflessness, almost a mindlessness about his own calling. Paul was like that. Who could say, imitate me as I imitate Christ? You know, uh, follow me in all my ways. And if you don't, you're you're likely out of the faith. Uh, And yet there's no arrogance. It's a remarkable thing. It's an ultimate thing. And uh, it's something that we need to uh, be jealous for. But we'll find ourselves entrapped and snared, not by our defects, but by our virtues. Your virtues can more do you in than your defects. Do you know what I mean? You remember in John, I, I forgot it, it's chapter 1 or chapter 2, it says that the many who believed on Jesus, but he would not trust himself to them, for he knew what was in man. And there came to him a man at night, Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. There's such a profound distrust of man in God, because he knows what is in man. The question is, do we know? Do we know what is in man? Do we know how how essentially depraved we are in our humanity. If we knew it, we would not seek to cultivate it, polish it, promote it, or live in it. We would despise it. It would be our filthy rags. 
let alone that we would think to serve God on the basis of it. And, and why should we be tested and how should we know that it is so utterly depraved that no good thing can come from it? It is adamically ruined, corrupt through and through, self-seeking, and however effete and well-mannered and polite and cultured it could be under certain circumstances, the very same people can be brought right from that to putting uh, Jews into ovens and without batting an eyelash and going to their Lutheran service right after and singing its hymns. That's, that's how depraved we are. Why? And what saves us then, uh, and gives us a basic distrust, not to trust man or our own humanity and, and, and compels us to be totally the people of the resurrection. We have no confidence in anything. We are the circumcision, Paul says, uh, who have no how does it in Philippians 3.3 3, somebody read that we are the circumcision the cut off ones why callest thou me good Jesus said to a man who sought to compliment him there's no man good but God yes. if Jesus didn't believe that he wouldn't have been baptized because John pro- the Baptist protested uh, I have need to be baptized of you you do it because it, it fulfills all righteousness you don't understand. You're impressed with me, but you don't understand that even though as the Son of Man, I'm still man. And there's something rotten, innately corrupt in man, and I'm identifying with man in my humanity as a second Adam. And that's why I, in my humanity, need to be crucified. I'm fulfilling for that Adam what is his penalty. And unless we understand the Adamic Sin, which Jewry has not understood. That's why we're humanists. That's why we celebrate man, and especially Jewish man. That's why we have to end, if you guys will only allow me to get there, (laughs) on the resurrection side. Or else we're left with a morbid emphasis on death and crucifixion, Mm -hmm. and God doesn't intend. That's not the end. It's a total thing. Uh, It has this inception, but it has this end in resurrection. Remember I showed you the the book of the portrait of Jesus crucified, a mm. horror to contemplate. You almost have to, they're painful to look at. But there's, you walk around and you get to the backside, there's the other side of the painting, is the resurrection. Mm. And it shows Jesus coming up out of the grave and the Roman centurions lurching forward from the power of that being raised from dead, that their helmets are, how the artists caught this, their helmets are toppling up, their spears are coming out of their hands, they're just, the power, and there's this glorious figure rising with his arms outstretched and beams of light and glory everywhere, but the beams of light and glory came through every perforation and wound in his body. So I'm saying that to say this, and also to answer your question, the resurrection is the other side, but it's always the resurrection of the crucified one. And his scars are always there to remind us. You know what I mean? We don't want to lose touch with either side of this reality. Mm-hmm. Or we will either become morbid, or we'll become superficially celebrative of the resurrection and forgot what it required to obtain. And that the same process of death and resurrection is a continual mo- uh, modus vivendi. It's a continuous mode of living and, if, and the one is not automatic. The one is always related to the other. When Paul says, I know, I'm determined not to know anything but Christ and crucified, is that to say that he's determined to forget the resurrection? No. Resurrection is implicit in Christ crucified. But he doesn't say, I'm determined not to know anything but, but Christ resurrected. He'd rather find his safety in the foundational event without which there would have been no resurrection. But we need to be reminded, resurrection follows. That's why we rejoice. And because the final upshot of it all is the last resurrection of being raised from the dead with the righteous. And those that are asleep in Christ are raised first, but those who are barely alive and being knocked from pillar to post in last day's persecution then ascend with them. That is our resurrection in glorified bodies. What was begun culminates in a final resurrection. The resurrection is an eschatological event. Jesus' resurrection is promised. That's the promise. The Holy Spirit that, that came down to us at Pentecost and in our baptism in the Spirit 
is a first fruits. It's a, a, a for portent. It's a down payment of what? It's a it's a tasting of the age to come when the full payment will be the final resurrection to be with him forever in glorified bodies and to ascend and descend upon the Son of Man in a whole new dimension of being and power and glory in being raised up out of the death of those who are in Christ. That's our anticipation because we have had the down payment. See what I mean? Paul, who was so uh, concerned about the Judaizing work of uh, shallow Jewish believers trying to get the Gentile Christians to be circumcised in their flesh. He called them mutilators. He said they are the workers of concision, of mere cutting, but we are the circumcision. By our union with Christ, who was cut off and out of the land of the living, not with hands, but by the cross, we have entered into that cutting, that circumcision, and we have no confidence in the flesh. We've been cut off and out from the flesh. Well, it's the obedience that flows out of the life, not according to the flesh, but by the Spirit, and live by the law of life in Christ Jesus. This is not legalism. This is liberty. This, this is freedom in Christ. To be free in Christ is free indeed, but not in some reckless way. It's an obedience, yes, but out of the life of the law of liberty in Christ Jesus. His life. Not some, what, should I do this, should I do that? What if, how am, you know, like, like this morning. Should I do this or should I do that? I'm still on line one. And I've not done it yet. How come? Because I'm ruled by the law of life and not by some mechanical strictures. You see what I mean? And that's the life to which we're called. And the only life that will um, celebrate and honor him and fulfill his will. Okay. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the great verdict of God. The fulfillment and proclamation of God's decision concerning the event of the cross. It is the acceptance of the act of his son appointed as our representative. An act which fulfilled the divine wrath but did so in the service of the divine grace. This is so beautiful, but I know that to hear it read does not register. So you see what I do? I mark up. I underline. I put it in boxes. I uh, mark it with a yellow marker. And, I, and I'll just look and ponder that. The resurrection of Jesus is God's own statement of the truth of the cross. It's his acceptance of his son's act, which is really his act. Because Jesus didn't make it up. Jesus only fulfilled it out of his own obedience. It was the Father's act. So it's like God validating himself, showing his own approval of what he himself established out of his own wisdom. Because he knows what was needed for the condition of mankind. That's why the resurrection is more opposed than the crucifixion of Jesus. Because there's a way in which even crucifixion can be sublimated to the purposes of men, sentimentalized, appealing for sympathy. One of the outworkings of it, as I mentioned, is that those who subscribe to that also subscribe to Jews as Christ killers. Isn't it interesting? The true believer who has come into the resurrection side never once ever hold such a view of Jews. We never ever call Jews Christ killers. Although they're not to say that they're absolved of their culpability in the death of Jesus. But that via that bitterness and vehemence that has persecuted Jews throughout the ages could never come from a true believer who is in the resurrection side. Only from those who are on the other side. So resurrection is enormously contended against. And I would say that the principle, uh, uh, this is just a minor point, opposition to myself as a minister of the word is on this basis, that those who are taking issue with me, especially now, currently, and at this time, strangely is over the issue of resurrection. Nothing offends them more than I should make any illusion that what I'm speaking and saying is not me, but the expression of the resurrection life through me sounds to them like a terrible presumption and an arrogance. 
Yet I want to say, if that's not true, I want never to leave home and to be out speaking for Christ's sake. If my speaking is not a resurrection phenomenon, it ought not to be spoken. The world doesn't need human opinion. It needs the expression of the life of God in the wisdom and the content and the authority that he gives. The remarkable thing is that when he gives it, men are so often offended by it. So, that's why resurrection is so critical. We're not going to fulfill our mandate as the church to Israel or to a dying world except on the basis of resurrection. Well-meaning religious intention will not do it. We'll end up a bunch of frustrated and defeated religious practitioners. We must eminently be the people of the resurrection, sons and daughters of the resurrection. And you know how Jesus describes such? They're like angels, he said. They're neither, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They're in another realm. What is it to say that if you're the son and daughter of the resurrection, you don't marry? You do, but you don't do so on any human basis. Because he's cute, or you like him, or uh, you think you'd make wonderful music together. Because the Lord of glory has joined you. That's the only reason. And even in that joining, your marriage is not like other marriages. Those, your marriage is like those who are married as though they were not. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not that you ignore your partner, but you don't look upon him with the slavish fascination or dependency or singular uh, attention as if there were no Lord and no God and no higher purpose for your being and for your life. It's another kind of marriage. So they neither marry nor are given in marriage as the world knows it. They are like angels. Uh, That's in uh, Luke chapter 20, I think around verse 14, that if you want to be a son and a daughter of resurrection, you have to have a totally different attitude about marriage. And marriage is only symbolic of everything, of the world, of life, of gratification, of career, of success. You're in another realm. And you see things from that realm differently. Or you're not a son and daughter of resurrection. Okay. So, it is its acceptance as the act of the Son of God appointed as our representative. An act which fulfilled the divine wrath. Jesus suffered the judgment of God. The crucifixion of Jesus was as much the judgment of God on sin as the holocaust of the Jews under the Nazis was the judgment of God upon Israel. All, both devastations are judgments and are equally deserved because God's judgments and God's wrath is not arbitrary. He doesn't lay it on either Jesus or the Jews or the world because he's a cruel God who takes malicious delight in pulling the wings off of flies. His judgments are proportionate to our sins. And those of you who will remain and will ever get back again into my paper on the Holocaust, we're going to talk about that in much greater detail. We need to know this. God's judgments are not arbitrary, but are exactly proportionate to our sins. So if Jesus was demolished by his crucifixion, if he was a piece of human wreckage, Uh, If that was the statement of God's wrath, what was the magnitude of the sin for which he bore it? You want to know what sin is? You want to know the exceeding sinfulness of sin? Look at what it cost him. Not just his physical devastation, but his moral, psychological, emotional, and spiritual. The forsakenness of the Father, which for Jesus, who lived in the intimacy of the Father, was more excruciatingly painful than what was visited upon his body. He had to bear that. Because he became the low, he became sin. He who knew no sin became sin, that we who were sinful would know the righteousness of God. He became it. <clears throat> so what is God saying by the resurrecting of him? I'm satisfied. What you bore as the sinless Son of God who became sin 
and allowed the, the consequence and judgment to fall upon you, I had received as appropriate and satisfying. My, my righteous requirement has been fulfilled in your death, and therefore you're raised. Your being raised out of the death is the statement of my approval of the death that you suffered and the purposes for which you suffered it. You've got to understand the resurrection as the vindication, the justification. We're justified by the resurrection of God's approval on that of the act of the death of Jesus, which is God's own design. It's God approving himself. It's God validating his own wisdom. It is its acceptance as the act of his obedience which judges the world, but judges it with the aim of saving it. You want to know what theological reflection is? It's that. Making a statement like that. Thinking your way through that. There's no more profound and sublime object for study than the scriptures. And all a theologian is, is a man who compares scripture with scripture, who wrestles through who wants to understand the meaning of the events of God and the word of God. So in this, the resurrection is the justification of God himself. Which God? God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, who has willed and planned and ordered this event. This is not some momentary historical aberration. This is not Jesus not playing his cards right. This is not the uh, uh, Roman authorities being threatened by people celebrating Jesus as king. This is the careful, planned, predetermined act of God the Father himself. Can anyone quote me a text from the New Testament that makes that very point? It's found in the first address of Peter on the day of Pentecost. The point that this is the predetermined, carefully planned, willed act of God. It's the very beginning of Peter's speech. 22 says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. This is a profound statement. And I quote this verse in the first Holocaust message of 1977 because it shows two profound things. It shows the unspeakable sovereignty of God who by his predeterminate counsel made a determination of, of the crucifixion of the Lamb of God before the foundations of the earth were laid but does not, because of that, absolve men of their culpability and responsibility as participants in his death. Have you ever struggled about free will and the sovereignty of God? You know, if God is sovereign, then is man responsible? I mean, because they had to do it, his will had to be fulfilled. This verse answers that. Here's the sovereign will of God, predetermined, calculated before the foundations of the world, and yet holding men liable culpable as participants in that death. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death whom God hath raised up. That's the basis for which he, he calls them to repentance. If they were not responsible, there's no basis for appealing to them to repent and believe and be baptized every one of you. See what I mean? So here you have both things. God as sovereign, predetermining something that must be fulfilled, and yet men acting out of their own volition and human freedom, being free and willing participants in his death. They are not absolved. So can you see that in the cross, and in the word of God about the cross, men are robbed of their excuse. Mm-hmm. And therefore we can confront every man as a sinner, as being culpable, not only in his own sin, but in this sin. Even though 2,000 years later, you are involved in that death. You are responsible. You are sin. And you've not seen that and acknowledged that. And yet, you know what the remarkable thing is? 
the event of the crucifixion of Jesus will not ever once come up in the entire O.J. Simpson case. As if men can determine the issues of righteousness, of guilt, of culpability, of judgment, and of death or release without once taking into consideration this epochal event. And that's why the world is what it is. It has refused to consider the God of whom Bart speaks, who made these determinations. So the resurrection is the justification of God himself who has willed and planned and ordered this event. It's the justification of Jesus Christ, his son, who willed to suffer this event and suffered it to the very last. And in his person is, is the justification of all sinful men whose death was decided in this event, for whose life there is therefore no more place. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his life and with it their life has in fact become an event beyond death. You can see the, the, the way he has thought through the entire thing, what the resurrection means in vindicating God. But the men who were caught up with Jesus in his death, uh, who were Adamic and, and are in union with him in that death, have also been released from death and have been brought into the newness of life and the Jesus that was raised from it, so that uh, his death and resurrection has in fact become for them an event beyond death and that's why Jesus can say because I live you shall live also and that's why Paul could say for me to live is Christ he was a man of the resurrection he was beyond death and that's why he was fearless and the issue of death is finished it's in the past I'm in the life see what I mean uh, oh death where is thy sting and grave where is thy terror and the thing that has terrified mankind since time immemorial the fear of death is broken and the fear of death is the base of all fear. Mm-hmm. Once, once you, you come out of the fear of death, what fear shall touch you? Of what shall you be afraid? Mm-hmm. What, men are going to rail on you and gnash on you with their teeth and call you names? And, you know, it's like water up the duck's back. It means nothing. You're, you're in another realm. You're in the resurrection. You're not in the earth. You're not some squealing thing wanting to be vindicated. You have been vindicated. You're in the life. It's it's enormous, expansive freedom if you have been joined with him in the death as a sinner deserving the the judgment and the wrath that was visited upon Jesus. You will also therefore equally be raised with him unto newness of life. The issue of resurrection is your issue. Not just the doctrine. And it's a basis for your living thereafter. No longer to live unto yourself nor for yourself but unto God and for God. On the basis of the new power of the life that raised him from the dead and raised you also. Death, where is thy sting? And grave, where is thy terror? Of what shall we be afraid? Our days are not to be ended by men. One moment short of the fulfillment of the thing for which God has called us. You can do nothing against me, Jesus said to Pilate, except to be given you from above. And when when, uh, Stephen said, lay not this into the charge, he fell asleep. Because that was the last statement God created him to make. And when it was made, his purpose was fulfilled. Then he was taken. You know, we ought to be walking through this life like such emancipated beings. And you know, when we know that, we can not only be free from fear, but there's a expansiveness, a largesse that comes into our life where we can be sports, where we can, uh, we're free with each other. We, we don't have to be critical, suspicious. Uh, we can bear so much. You know, it's another mm. mode of being. And I'm saying that the issue of resurrection has not been pressed on the consciousness of unbelieving mankind because they have not seen the reality in the people of God. Thank mm-hmm. you.